Houston Baptist College, Houston, Texas. It was a typical Texas morning on the campus of this new Christian institution. It had all the appearances of an ordinary day as students began to arrive. But before nightfall, there would be changes in the lives of many. For today, Billy Graham will ask thousands of teenagers to give their lives to Christ. Houston Baptist College had sent special invitations to students in high schools throughout Houston and surrounding communities to attend this climactic day of Religious Emphasis Week. Television cameras would carry Dr. Graham's message to other thousands of people who were unable to attend. The quadrangle fill is the hour neared for Billy Graham to speak. And still they came. Guests of the college, businessmen and women, educators, students. They spill over into the student center in classrooms where closed circuit television made it possible for them to see and hear. It wasn't an ordinary day. As Dr. D.D. Tidwell read the 23rd Psalm, a calmness settled on the tremendous crowd. The, table before me in the, the familiar words echoed across the quadrangle. Surely, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Dr. William H. Hatton, first president of Houston Baptist College, presented the Lamar High School Choralettes directed by Mr. Lee Keating. This nationally known teenage ensemble added to the spirit of the occasion by singing the Lord's Prayer. How difficult it is, yet what a privilege it is to introduce the speaker of this occasion. A man known around the world that has touched the lives of literally millions of people, a man truly called of God that is here to speak for us and to us today. We've requested Dr. Graham to bring an inspirational message because we know he will touch our hearts. If I were to select a scripture in presenting this man, I think I would go to Romans 10, chapter 10, verse 14 and 15. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. I present to you truly a man of God Dr. Billy Graham. Dr. Hinton, 
members of the faculty, board of trustees, members of the student body, seniors, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great privilege for me to be here today and to participate in this historic occasion at the beginning of a great new Christian institution in the city of Houston. Dr. Hinton has uh, suggested today that I not give an academic address. I'm relieved because I hadn't planned on it anyway. <laughs> he said to give an inspirational address to young people, uh, which I hope uh, this will be. But I want to say a word about how delighted I am at this uh, tremendous enterprise here in Houston. We are living in a day when secularism has overwhelmed education in various parts of the country. And there's nothing any more lost today or confused and bewildered than a student on a large university campus. For example, at one Eastern University, they have 10 psychiatrists who deal only with students who need help. And if you wanted an appointment with a psychiatrist, it would take you three months to get it. They're so booked up on that campus. Confused, bewildered. Thank God for an institution that has purpose and meaning and where there is a belief in God. Where when you take a course in chemistry or physics or geology, whatever course you're taking, it's within a Christian framework. And we're told that back of this universe is a supreme being that we call God. And for an institution that stands without any apology for the crucified Redeemer who is the reconciler of the world. And the world today is facing tremendous and overwhelming social and political problems and there is no answer apart from the cross of Jesus Christ. The race problem that is so bewildering to many the political problem that has divided the world between two great ideologies. There is no reconciliation apart from a transformation from the inside out. Christ said your problems are not social, they're not political, they're not economic. Your basic problems are from within. He said get the heart right and you can change the world. This institution is dedicated not only to training the mind, but to fortifying the character and building spiritual men and women that will go out with purpose and meaning in their lives. And so it's a great delight for me to participate in this great meeting here today. Now, most of you that are here today are teenagers. And to try to talk to teenagers is a very difficult job. I have three, let's see, let's see, yes, three. Three teenagers in my family. One of them just crossed the line the other day. And I've changed a lot of my ideas about teenagers since I had some of my own. They're the most terrific, the most dynamic, the most powerful group in this country. And I get a great kick out of talking to them. But I heard about one father that took his son aside and he said, son, don't you think it's about time you and I discuss the facts of life and the son said, I sure do, Dad. What do you want to know? <laughs> and many people are asking the question today, what is life all about? What is the purpose and the meaning of life? And young people are marching all over the world. They may be marching for Castro, or they may be marching in Algeria for Bendela, or they may be marching in Ghana for Nkrumah. They may be marching in Kenya for Kenyatta. They may be marching in China for Mao Zedong. They may be marching in the Soviet Union, as I've seen them, for Khrushchev. But all over the world, young people are marching under a flag. And I find that young people are searching for a creed to believe, a song to sing, and a flag to follow. Something they can believe in, something they can give themselves to something they can die for if necessary. Someone asked the question, what is the greatest motivating desire within human nature? 
And three of the world's great psychologists answered that question in three different ways. One was Dr. Adler. Dr. Adler said, the greatest desire that man has is the desire to be somebody, to be recognized, status. But God said, you must be forgiven of your sin. And that's why Christ came. Christ was God in the flesh. And what a magnetic person he must have been. Jesus Christ could say to a man like Matthew, a tax gatherer, follow me. And he would get up and follow him to a great boisterous man like Peter, follow me. What a man he must have been. He wasn't an effeminate person like you see hanging on a wall, some artist conception. He was every inch a man. A man with a purpose. A man with an objective, a young man. Eleven years younger than I am when he died. And what a man he was. He changed the whole world. And he said, come and follow me and we'll change the world. Another psychologist was asked, what is the greatest desire that human nature has? And he said, Dr. Young of Austria, the greatest desire is to be secure. No longer do we want an opportunity but we want security. And the whole psychology of America today is security. Our forefathers, the men that fought at the Alamo, the men that built Texas into this great empire, wanted only an opportunity. And they built Texas. And they weren't asking for security. But we want security. And there's always a desire for security. But the Bible tells us that we'll only have complete security in Christ. You say, oh, if I could be a popular film star, or if I could be something like that, if I could be rich, maybe I could make a million dollars, I'd be secure. Oh, no. Ernest Hemingway changed the whole style of writing in this country and in the English-speaking world and was famous and wealthy, powerful with a pen, but he took a shotgun and blew his brains out. Empty searching for purpose and meaning and not finding it. He never found security in his fame. He never found security in money because there is no satisfaction outside of a knowledge of God. You see, you were made for God. You were made for fellowship with God and without God, you'll never find what you're searching for. It'll be a search all your life. You can go out and have a sex experience. You can get drunk. You can have money. That's all temporary, it all passes in a moment, and it leaves you bitter and remorseful and empty and still searching. Why don't you give your life to Christ when you're young? And he'll give you that security that even though you're in a jail, or you're in a prison, or you're in a concentration camp, or you're in a war, or you're in danger, or you're in ill health, or you're poor, there is great security in Christ. And then thirdly, Dr. Freud, Sigmund Freud said, the desire to be loved. All of us want to be loved, certainly. But in this country, we have taken sex and degenerated it into something dirty and ugly. There's nothing hush-hush in the Bible about this subject. It's a subject that all young people are thinking about and talking about, and I think it's one that the church ought to discuss openly and frankly to give guidance and leadership. There's nothing wrong with it if it's used within the confines of the moral laws laid down by God, but you break those laws and there's no sin that will destroy your relationship with God anymore. There's no sin that will harden your heart anymore. There is no sin that will damn your soul anymore. This is a creative energy that God has given us, dedicated to God, and it will be a flaming fire that can be used in your life for good. But let it become your master. But we have a desire to be loved, not sensual love, but a genuine love to have a friend, to have somebody close to you, to have somebody that loves you and believes in you. Let me tell you, when you look at the cross of Jesus Christ and you see him dying in your place, and you see the nails in his hands and you see the crown of thorns on his brow and you see the spear in his side and you see the blood dripping down his body, God is saying to you, I love you. I love you. I love you. 
And this meets this desire that Dr. Freud says that we all have to be loved. And we can all have the sense, even in the loneliest hours, in the most tragic conditions, when disappointment and bereavement comes, there's the sense of God's love that wraps around you and embraces you. You can come to Christ and find that sense of belonging and being loved. You know, in high school and college, you can argue and debate all the fine points of religion the rest of your life and never make a decision. Sometime, somewhere, at this age, say, all right, I'm deciding. I'm making a commitment. I'm deciding for Christ right now. You can do it. It's a simple decision. It's a commitment that you make and you never go back on it. And you can do it here today in the quietness of your heart because Christ is a challenge to accept. I saw 50,000 students in Red Square in Moscow marching, stamping their feet, shaking their fists, and I asked the interpreter what they were shouting. She said, they're saying we're going to change the world. There was the red star, there was the red flag, determination on their faces in beautiful blouses and uniforms marching for atheism why couldn't we march as young people for christianity and for everything that america stands for and believes in you say but what do i have to do there are three things that christ requires first sometimes somewhere you must repent of your sin that's not easy we don't like to say I'm wrong, but sometime you've got to stand before his cross in a moment like this and say, I'm wrong, I'm sorry, I'm willing to turn from my sins. I'm willing to give them up, the things that are wrong in my life. Secondly, there has to come a time when by faith you receive him as your own Lord and Master and Savior. In a moment like this today, you could receive him for yourself. Lastly, you must be willing to obey him. You must go back to the campus, back to the high school, back to the gang, back to the crowd, and live for Christ, even if it means death. Even if it means they crucify him. And that's what Jesus said it would mean in many instances. They may laugh, they may call you crazy and strange, but it means that you're willing to stand out for Christ, whatever the cost. You'll say no when they want you to do things that are wrong. You'll have a smile on your face, but there comes a point beyond which you will not go in your moral convictions. You're willing to go to church. You're willing to participate in the things of the church. Shall we pray? I'm going to ask that we bow our heads for a moment of prayer. Our Father and our God, we thank thee for these young hearts that have been surrendered to thee. Give us the faith to believe and Lord God, we pray thy blessing upon Houston Baptist College. Dr. Hinton, the members of the faculty and staff, the student body, the board of trustees, may this institution ever believe and stand for and proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ without apology in every classroom. And may this be one institution in the midst of an increasing secularism that stands for the kingdom of God and for faith in the Bible as the word of God. And for everyone that lifted their hands today, we commit into thy keeping. In Christ's name, amen. kind of dignity, the thousands of people slowly made their way out of the college quadrangle, back to the campus, back to the classroom, back to the office, back to the press of daily activities and responsibilities. They came to hear what Christianity could mean amid the tensions, temptations, and perplexities confronting them today. They heard. For many, students and adults alike, 
Their own Christian experiences were enriched, character strengthened, morality elevated. Others came to know Jesus Christ, the most meaningful of all experiences. And Houston Baptist College and Christian higher education received the thundering approval of this outstanding messenger of God, Billy Graham. As the meeting ended, there was a reverent silence which seemed to whisper and then to shout, to God be the glory.